this morning I'm proud to stand with our uh, Auditor General, Eugene De Pasquale, in order to be able to talk about the importance of his leadership in legalizing cannabis within the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, I stand with Mayor Kenny from Philadelphia, the mayors of the Lehigh Valley, the mayor of Erie, and other elected officials throughout this state in understanding that this issue uh, not only has a revenue side to it, but it also has a personal side to it. People whose lives are thrown out of balance uh, because of the penalization of cannabis not being legal. People who are not able to uh, be able to have access to housing or access to jobs or access to an opportunity in life. And, and as we look in the city of Pittsburgh, we can see that it also breaks down by racial barriers as well. Um, the, the legalization of cannabis is something that is not only happening throughout our nation, state by state, but something that is happening in countries itself, like Canada. And we are either going to be a leader or we will be a follower. But there is no doubt in my mind that we will, at one point, legalize cannabis within the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, I want to thank the Auditor General for taking a courageous stand. Uh, my position has evolved over the past several years, uh, watching friends and family suffer through cancer and knowing that there's a plant that could help them uh, that was not made available for medicinal reasons in the past, now is, but still has a stigma attached to it and understanding that people who are suffering during this opioid epidemic uh, could be treated if we had an opportunity to open this up. But there's also a financial side to it as well. And as the Auditor General will go through, there's an opportunity for government to regulate the distribution and be able to help and assist in many different programs. So with that, uh, Auditor General. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, I want to thank the mayor um, publicly, certainly have done that privately, on his tremendous leadership on this issue, um, as well as his tremendous work as mayor of this great city and his friendship for many years as well. Um, and when I first ran for Auditor General in 2012, um, I had said, let's see what happens in the states that have gone down the legalization path to see what happens before I make a firm decision one way or the other. And last year, is in the spring, about April, so it was April about 2017, the data was coming in and it was pretty clear to me that it was time to get on board with regulating and taxing marijuana. And for the last year or so, I've been talking about that issue as the state's fiscal watchdog that I thought it just made the most sense to do this, to go down this path. But the debate was, to be blunt, getting a little stale. And what I mean by that is, I would say it, people would retweet it, and the legislature wouldn't move. And so I told my team, let's try to break down some of these barriers to see what we can do to move the debate forward. And to me, the way to break down that barrier would be, let's find out what the actual data is, and let's find out what the money is, so that we can actually try to put some concrete issues before the General Assembly and the governor on what I think is something that both makes fiscal sense for the state and also makes good social sense for the state. So today, I'm releasing this 14-page special report on what would happen in Pennsylvania conservatively if we regulate and tax marijuana, in a sense, legalize cannabis. So um, one of the things that, you know, maybe a little bit of a side note, is that this is also an issue where I think Look, Bill and I are politicians, but I think if there is one issue where the public is ahead of the elected leadership of this state, and probably even the elected leadership of this country, it is on cannabis. Right now, 61% of all Americans support, according to recent polling by reputable polling services, legalizing marijuana. That is a higher percentage of people than people that disagree with the president's performance in Helsinki. 
I say that not to compare the two issues. I say that there's a, a broader consensus on legalizing marijuana than there is on the president's performance in Helsinki. And in Pennsylvania, it's 56%. Now, when I first came out with this proposal in April of 2017, support in Pennsylvania was at roughly 46%. So that 10% is clearly the D. Pasquale bump. I mean, I mean, it's clear, like, what else would it be? I, I'm, I'm kidding only to say that this is an issue that is clearly moving in a direction where there is broad acceptance. And why? Because states are either decriminalizing or legalizing, and even the people that maybe had some reservations are starting to see the nightmare scenarios just do not happen. So the report that we're releasing today, that I'm releasing today, along with the mayor, reports a staggering amount of tax revenue the state would reap each year if Pennsylvania legislators simply did what their constituents want them to do, and that is regulate and tax marijuana for adult use. And the proposal I'm suggesting is at the age of 21, similar to alcohol consumption. Based on research and experience in other states, and we'll detail how we get to this number, my estimate in the special report today is that Pennsylvania could realize at least, and I'm going to say this at least, $581 million per year in tax revenue. And again, let that number sink in. $581 million conservatively without a broad-based tax increase on any single Pennsylvanian. Just imagine what good we could do with that in Pennsylvania. And I'll discuss in a few minutes why I believe that is a conservative estimate. Now, I'm sure you know, the mayor talked about this a few minutes ago. You know, Canada became the second country to legalize marijuana for adult use. And as you see, Canada is still a country. It didn't lead to some implosion of, of them. Um, they're still doing fine. The last month, New York's Governor Andrew Cuomo, his health department issued a report recommending full adult use legalization there. Let me give you a little bit of piercing the corporate veil. That means he supports it, but was looking for uh, a little bit of support from his own agencies to justify that. Other states that, have, that are um, considering proposals would be Ohio, West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey. It is actually part of the governor's budget proposal, and the legislature is now debating, in a sense, some of the finer points of that issue. But New Jersey will be um, in legalization, I think, by a minimum uh, January of this year. The time for Pennsylvania legislators to act is right now. Now the math. Pennsylvania has about 9.5 million adults that's described uh, or defined as 21 and older. Okay, so about 9.5 million. According to the national survey data by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, an average of 8.38% of Pennsylvania adults admit to using marijuana monthly right now. That translates to nearly 800,000 adults. For guidance in determining how much the average user might spend each year, we turn to Colorado and Washington. Both states legalized marijuana in 2012 and have historical data to pull from. In those states, the average user spends about $2,080 per year on marijuana. So, again, we're just going through the conservative estimate here. If we assume Pennsylvania users would spend the same amount per person as Colorado or, and Washington, that means that the legal marijuana industry in Pennsylvania would be $1.66 billion. That's a new industry in Pennsylvania of $1.66 billion that would develop literally overnight. That would create a larger retail market here than in Colorado and Washington combined. Now let's look at how we would tax the industry. Again, just going by how we tax other industries of similar, I know they're not technically the same, but similar functions. So. In other states, similar to Colorado and Washington, how they tax marijuana, we looked at that. We looked at how we tax alcohol and cigarettes here and how taxes towards medicinal marijuana work. And based on those factors, I'm suggesting roughly 35% in, in state taxes. There'd be a 10% uh, producer grower excise tax. Again, these are taxes that already exist. 
19% retail sales excise tax, and a 6% sales tax. As Mayor Peduto has talked about a little earlier, um, and we'll talk a little bit about again in a few minutes. One of the things that we're recommending is that there's so much revenue that would flow from this that I recommend that Philadelphia and Allegheny counties each be given authority to impose their own local taxes of one to two percent, similar to what happens in RAD in Allegheny County and certainly happens in Philadelphia as well. So assuming we tax the 1.66 billion retail industry at 35 percent, that equals 581 million in state tax revenue annually. That is recurring revenue. And in Allegheny and Philadelphia counties, they would be looking at 3.8 million and 6.9 million respectively. Again, that's recurring revenue, money that comes in every <laughs> single year. I say all three of those are conservative estimates because they do not take into account numerous other factors. First of all, new businesses. They would be generating economic activity, creating retail, cultivation, and manufacturing jobs. And I know it may not be the biggest issue in the city of Pittsburgh, um, but I also know that one of the things that we should all care about as a commonwealth is it would be a boon to the rural parts of Pennsylvania as well that would give them a new crop, some of our struggling small farmers. This would give them a new crop that they could begin to grow, and so some of our rural parts of the state would see a boon from that side of it as well. This also does not account for the decreased criminal justice costs associated with decriminalization, since simple possession of marijuana would no longer lead to prosecution. And the present percentage of Pennsylvanians, adults admitting to using marijuana monthly, might not be, considering it's illegal, the exact amount that actually do use it on a monthly basis. So we're not projecting any increase in the amount from the estimate of 8.38%. So what that doesn't include is people, let's be honest, if they're calling a poll and they think it's illegal, there might be hypothetically some people that aren't telling the truth in that poll. And it's also not coming at it from it would lead to increased usage. We don't know those. We're just going by the percent that already admit to using it on a monthly basis. So, and the other thing it does not take into account is the impact on tourism dollars. One thing that Colorado and Washington have both seen, both those states have seen, is a boon to their tourism industry. Now, this is an issue, again, I want to be firm on this, that the longer we wait to do this and the more other states go down this path, the more Pennsylvania will be a follower. I think we are in a prime position to be a leader on this issue, but the longer we wait, the more likely we're going to be a follower. Because let me tell you something, the train is pulling out of the station. Now let's talk a little bit about what that $581 million can be used for. For starters, I believe it can help kids immediately. For example, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP as many people know it, is already remarkably successful, providing health care coverage for 180,000 children. For every 10 million in new funding, about 5,000 more children can receive health care coverage through the Children's Health Insurance Program. Part of the 581 million could also help fund more pre-K and full-day kindergarten programs. I know this is a major cause for the mayor here, and I know Mayor Kenny in Philadelphia as well, as well as mayors all over the state, that when we give kids of low income means that pre-K, it is that means they're ready when they enter kindergarten, and every study has shown that it doesn't matter which think tank, that K to three is a critical part of any childhood or any educational outcome. So for kids to have access to that pre-K program makes them more ready by the time they enter third grade. That is the line when we see whether kids are going to be on a better path or not. And this is another tool. And I know the mayor and I are going to have some other ideas down the line that we can find to put some more money in the pre-K, but this would be able to help kids immediately in the city of Pittsburgh get that critical early education. Additional money could also provide relief for the child welfare system. The state-administered county-run systems con continues to struggle to protect at-risk kids. It could increase staff salaries, add caseworkers, supervisors, and also provide more preventive and diversionary programs for children and families, such as the Nurse Family Partnership. Part of the $581 million could also be used to fight the opioid epidemic that rages across Pennsylvania. 
The Commonwealth spends only 20 million right now of its own money in the 2017-18 budget to provide life-saving treatment for those battling addiction. Additional funding will help provide more opioid recovery treatment and help prepare for the looming meth crisis. Also, part of the 581 million could be used to improve care that veterans receive. And one thing I think it is important to note, um, and I know, um, you know, locally Congressman Doyle uh, would be on board with this, but marijuana right now at the federal level is a Schedule I narcotic, which, to be blunt, is insane. <laughs> For veterans to get access to this care through their veterans health insurance program and through the VA, it has to be removed as a Schedule I narcotic. And also for the industry to truly flourish in Pennsylvania once it is legalized, we have to be able to engage the bank industry, credit cards, et cetera, because right now even in the states it's been legalized, it's operating on a cash basis because of the Schedule I narcotic designation at the federal level. Even President Trump has said that the states should be able to decide this on their own. So the conclusion, just these are some of the areas that I believe from protecting kids, from better educational outcomes, from having a more, um, uh, to be blunt, a saner criminal justice system, these are just some of the benefits from what could happen with the $581 million conservatively estimated in new tax revenue for the state of Pennsylvania. Now is the time for Pennsylvania to stop imagining how it could benefit from regulating and taxing marijuana and to begin realizing those benefits. So with that, again, I want to thank the mayor for his courage in supporting my effort on this. And um, certainly, the numbers are real. And again, I want to stress, they are conservative from what would happen in Pennsylvania. And I know that there would be a political fight of what, ha what would happen with the $581 million. I get that. And that's what we have legislatures and governors for. But I'd rather have the fight over what to do to spend with new money as to what's been happening over Pennsylvania over the last 10 years is how do we continue to carve up a smaller and smaller pie. This is a chance to grow the pie in a way that's good for business, good for social justice, it's good for health care, and finally, because I know this may be a, and it would be a fair question, as a parent of two teenage kids, I believe that if this is done right, it will actually, because this has happened in Colorado, decrease access to minors on this issue. Why? Because if it is being sold legally, go try, how many 14-year-olds go to a grocery store and can buy wine? They check everyone's single ID. I believe that same process would happen in Pennsylvania. I'm not saying eliminate, but it would decrease access and also would provide a safer avenue for marijuana because the people selling it would then have to be selling something that has been regulated by the health department as opposed to buying it from some junk on the street. So with that, again, thank you. Again, thank the mayor um, and more than happy to answer any questions. And, and mayor, you may want to talk about some of the local impact as well, um, potentially with the tax revenue. That's up to you. Questions for us on this issue? Um, the, the President's recent statements notwithstanding, we, the U.S. Attorney General has been very vocal about his opposition to legalization. Curious how you see that playing out over the next couple of years, and would it make sense to hold off trying to legalize it and set up the structure in Pennsylvania until that becomes more clear? Um, I don't believe in waiting for Jeff Sessions on anything. Um, <laughs> so look, is it the ideal outcome? that the federal government would change it. I think actually in the next session of Congress, I wouldn't be shocked if a bill moves through the, the Congress and is signed by the president, removing it from a Schedule I narcotic. I wouldn't be surprised, because I think that's probably the most likely scenario as opposed to Jeff Sessions waking up one day and realizing that you know 40 years of his public life have been wrong on this issue. Um, I think that is a much more realistic scenario. I would rather the state move ahead with it I think there's a couple things that would happen. Number one is I think that would put more pressure on the Congress because we wouldn't be the only state. Um, and number two, I think it, um, there is a way, as the other states have shown, to doing it without the feds changing that. And I think it's inevitable that this federal government is eventually going to do it anyway. Any other questions? Mayor, Mayor. You, you mentioned that um, you kind of evolved on this issue and you cited your family's medical reasons. When did you kind of, was the tipping point when you kind of shifted toward recreational use for it all? Um, 
There wasn't a specific time. It was really an understanding. Uh, watching people in the city, especially young people, who if they had the resources were able to hire attorneys, go through an ARD program, have it on their record but being able to shift their life to be able to get back on track. But if they didn't have money, being able to have a record and then that holding them back. Watching uh, several friends struggle through cancer and uh, personally watching as uh, the treatment itself uh, devastated them as much as the cancer and knowing that there was a way to be able to lessen the effects. Um, and just a basic understanding of uh, what's happened in Colorado and what's happened in Washington didn't lead to crime increase, it didn't lead to outbreaks of uh, drug epidemics, uh, but it actually has been able to help in dealing with opioid epidemic and treating those that are struggling with addiction. Um, it's been a series of uh, learning uh, over several years. I would say that I probably still have a little bit of that stigma and I'm sure that a lot of people that are listening to a press conference with two elected officials talking about the legalization of marijuana, especially with older Pittsburghers, are probably feeling that same. Like, what are they talking about? But when you realize that there is this opportunity where um, this plant has the ability to help people, and at the same time, we're not talking about $581 million one time. We're talking about something that's already out there and what we're doing is regulating it and being able to bring in $581 million every single year to help all of the programs that the, attorney, or the Auditor General has spoken about. Um, all of that combined over the course of the past five years has led me from a position of decriminalization to full legalization and regulation. And Mayor, while you're here, what updates do you have in regard to Uber and the testing of their We're not doing that yet. No. Uh, Mr. Mayor. We'll do that after. But yeah, I'm not sure. hanging around. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, uh, Pittsburgh enacted a decriminalization ordinance, but in 2017 we still had 700 people being charged with a small amount going through city court, yeah. being fingerprinted and being potentially faced with uh, having to get their records expunged. Uh, what is your office doing to encourage the police or to require the police to cite under the decriminalization ordinance instead of the status quo of charging people with misdemeanor uh, possession offenses? So many of those, and we'll have a specific number, are ancillary to another crime. Somebody who shoots at a police officer who also has possession. Both of those charges are brought up. Uh, as far as the number of people who have been solely charged with possession of marijuana or smoking it, I've asked the chief to separate those into another um, category. And then once we are able to um, know Specifically, I'm asking that it be broken down geographically. What neighborhoods are we targeting? Um, I want to make sure that if it is being uh, enforced, that it's being done on a fair basis um, and being able to get a little bit more of a background before making any uh, changes within the Bureau itself. So uh, I, from what I've been told from the uh, chief himself is that most of these are add-on charges to a more serious crime. But I'll get that number and we'll be able then to map it and look at it. Thank you. Yep. Have arrests decreased by 50% already in some of the literature here, marijuana arrests? since the decriminalization bill. Within the city, I don't have those numbers, and um, I'm, I'm not sure until the chief gets me that those numbers. Yeah, one, the numbers that we did, we had, had pretty solid numbers from Philadelphia on that, which we believe are reflected in the report. We didn't have the concrete numbers from Pittsburgh yeah. yet. Anything else? Uh, yes, earlier this spring, uh, Dr. Levine announced that they were going to approve plant flower sale to, for medical patients. Yes. Uh, but at the same time, she made a point of emphasizing that there are, they don't recommend smoking it, that there are health costs. Um, I mean, you've talked a lot about the, the savings in you know, criminal yeah. prosecutions, but won't there be health costs uh, lined if we're, if we're legalizing an activity that 
uh, could encourage this? Uh, a couple of things. Number one is it already happens anyway. Some of those health care costs already happen anyway. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I am not suggesting that before Game 7 of the World Series when the Pirates are in it, that our starting pitcher light one up before Game 7. Okay, I recognize, and I want to be clear about this, we got to get there first to Game 7. I get that. <laughs> Something like that worked for Doc Ellis. That, 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 yeah, Doc, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, let's give, yeah I, the Doc Ellis thing, let's keep this on track. Um, I am not suggesting that this is something that has no drawback. The reason why this is a weighted public policy issue is it because there are pros and cons to it, right? I mean, if it was all pro and no con, it probably would have been decided decades ago. Consuming alcohol has some health drawback. We also know there's some health benefit to it if consumed moderately. Now, cigarettes, that's a whole different ballgame. That's legal, and I still haven't seen one study that says it's anything other than bad. There are health impacts from cigarette smoking. So I, I just want to say that some of these other – gambling is another one. Look, I'm not a big slots person. I, I think there's more of a benefit you know, if people want to enjoy it with blackjack and poker. But there's pros and cons to gaming being legal. And there's some people that have addiction problems related to that. But on the whole – the legislature waited, there was more positive than negative there. I simply think on marijuana, the pros significantly outweigh the cons. And do you think Secretary Levine would, would agree with that recommendation to legalize? Um, I don't know the answer to that, and I don't want to speak for the Secretary. And to be very blunt about this, we're on a campaign to change minds. And that those minds to change are every single Pennsylvanian that disagree with us, and the ones that do agree, to try to get them more engaged in the process. Uh, this is, a, in a sense, a campaign. Anything else? When you talk about the pros specifically of recreational use, it's largely monetary. Yeah. Um, and you talked a lot about what else we could do with that money. Um, but would you push for some kind of lockbox me lock measures to make sure that revenue from this does get funneled oh. to some of the specific things you talked about and yeah. just doesn't end up in general. Yeah, it is certainly a fair point. And um, as we know, with our General Assembly, um, things can have a way of meandering through the process. Um, but I would be advocating strongly for these positions. I can't guarantee what the General Assembly would do. I would be, at this stage of the game, stunned that a Republican legislature, because let's just assume that the current framework stays the same, that Governor Wolf is reelected, and you have a Republican General Assembly. I would be stunned if the G Republican General Assembly would pass this and then just give Governor Wolf $581 million to spend as he chooses. So I do think that there's much more likely of there being some earmarking of the funds. But these are some of the programs that I would be strongly advocating for. Anything else? Thanks, everybody. Everyone, thank you very much. Thanks. Hey, you got it.